it, it's a real privilege for me to introduce uh, the chief of our division, Dr. Myung Park, who did her training at Virginia and Commonwealth, followed by uh, cardiology and advanced heart failure training at Cleveland Clinic, led the program at Oshner from an advanced heart failure transplant perspective, nationally, internationally recognized for expertise in pulmonary hypertension, and specifically has, been a, has played a leadership role in several key uh, trials. Uh, we were lucky to um, have her come from University of Maryland and, and, and serve in this capacity for, for our center. She's positioned nicely to give us an update on detecting and treating pulmonary hypertension. Jonathan Gardner, who completed his uh, cardiology training at the University of Tennessee, is our advanced heart failure fellow. So we're delighted Dr. Gardner will kick it off with a case-based presentation. All right, hello everyone. So here's our case presentation. This is a 65-year-old female referred uh, to our clinic for further evaluation for shortness of breath. She's got a past mental history for over 10 years of scleroderma. She's on home oxygen with two liters uh, for the past few years when she sleeps. Uh, she's, been, she's been complaining of gradual increase in um, breathlessness with um, um, ADLs for over the past three to four months, walking around the house, unable to climb stairs, all of them more difficult. Prior to these three or four months, uh, she hasn't had any real noticeable limitations. Uh, she's also having some increased dizziness with bending over, uh, some reported swelling, uh, but, um, <clears throat> as well as chest pain with activities, but denies any syncope or passing out. Of note, this, these symptoms started around the time when she returned back from Europe, which was about three or four months ago. Uh, again, past medical history, a history of scleroderma with Crest syndrome, further complicated by esophageal dysmotility, as well as rectal prolapse, non of coronary disease and remote history of DVT, uh, surgical history of appendectomy, non-specific uh, social history. She did have two pregnancies without complications, lives at home with her husband, moderate drinker, non-smoker, no drug use, and family history not significant as well. Uh, meds that she's on, she's on aspirin 81 a day, uh, Lipitor, a PPI, multivitamin, and Pro-Air as needed for shortness of breath. Uh, in the clinic, her vitals, uh, mild elevation of blood pressure, low normal O2 sats, Otherwise, you know, reasonable weight, BMI of 25. Uh, her exam, for the most part, is very benign, no JVD, normal cardiac exam, normal S1, S2, no murmurs, got some rubs. Lungs were um, unremarkable with just diminished breath sounds only at the bases. Um, extremities were, uh, showed uh, the trace of extremity edema. Skin was warm, she lived orange times three. She did have uh, chronic changes from scleroderma visible on her hands. The data from her labs, uh, also her labs were pretty, uh, Unremarkable as well. Creatinine, uh, kidney function was normal. Liver function was normal. She had hemoglobin was 12.6. BMP was elevated 381. Uh, chest X-ray was unremarkable. EKG was unremarkable. And echo, a year ago from an outside hospital, was showed preserved EF, mild RV enlargement and function, uh, but no significant uh, valvular abnormalities. And uh, stress test was normal, uh, negative. Uh, we perform an one of our echocardiograms here for her, and again her. Heart function shows the EF of 55 to 60 percent. However, this time the RV is severely enlarged. Her RV function is also moderately to severely depressed. The right atrium is uh, severely enlarged. There is di uh, dilated trusted um, annulus coaptation is with moderate TR, and then a PA systolic pressure of 70 to 75 millimeters of mercury with an assumed right atrial pressure of 15 to 20, which is substantially elevated. All right, so what would you do if this was your patient? Would you A, give uh, sildenafil, B, do a right heart cath, C, CT angio, or D, right heart cath with a vasodilatory challenge? More than one person should answer. <laughs> oh, great time for music, perfect. <laughs> okay, oh, this is good, this is very interesting. I love this dynamic view of what people are thinking. <coughs> All right, so this is perfect. I could not have set this up better even if I tried. <laughs> OK. All right, so with that, um, please remember between the Rahar Cat and Rahar Cat based on the challenge about half and half split. Oh, thank you. So um, I'm going to cover just some of the basics of uh, pulmonary hypertension 101, if you will. But I think this, these are uh, important concepts to know as we go forward, as we see our patients. So pulmonary hypertension is defined as a mean PA pressure greater than or equal to 25. In order to have pulmonary arterial hypertension, you must have that. Also with wedge pressure less than or equal to 15 and a pulmonary vascular resistance that's greater than three wood units. 
Um, so this is the latest uh, clinical classification of pulmonary hypertension from the NICE uh, World Health Organization meeting. There's another meeting that will be convened actually later this month, and, and I'm sure we'll get an update on this. But for now, you can see that there are five uh, clinical uh, subtypes of the um, uh, uh, pH with group one being, being the pulmonary arterial hypertension made up of idiopathic, the heritable, uh, those associated with certain type of drugs, um, and also associ associated with certain diseases like the connective tissue disease, like the lady we're talking about, HIV, portal hypertension, and so forth. Uh, pulmonary hypertension two is the one due to left heart disease. This is one uh, huge uh, uh, population base of patients we take care of. Any heart failure clinic is loaded with patients that have group two pulmonary hypertension. We really don't have an approved therapy as of yet. Um, that is uh, uh, being uh, uh, diligently worked on. Hopefully, we'll have something to share with you soon. Pulmonary hypertension, uh, group three, those with lung disease, four with a CTAP, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, which I'll cover also a little bit later, and uh, uh, group five, which is sort of the uh, mixture of other uh, etiologies that can lead to pulmonary hypertension, such as sarcoidosis, those with renal failure, and end up with the pulmonary hypertension. So all of the medications that we have approved belong to here or here. And, and ironically, as I stated, uh, group two, which is the, the largest population, we don't have any treatment as of yet. Uh, this just uh, encompasses a very, very brief uh, overview of the pathophysiology of pulmonary hypertension. In essence, it is a disease where you have a luminal um, closure in the pulmonary arterial tree from medium sized to small sized vessels. You can see on the left hand side, they are very healthy, uh, uh, open uh, pulmonary arteries. Over time, that gets occluded with cellular infiltration of adventitial uh, and, and intima and all different layers. And with that, what you're what you see is um, uh, increase in pulmonary pressures and, of course, resistance, but, but gradually as the RV dilates, falling cardiac output, and this is about the time when patients are feeling the symptoms. This is when they get the palpitations, the breathlessness, and the swelling, and in some people, frank syncope, as the right-sided cannot really for the uh, manifest the cardiac output that they need to support with their activities. So. Um, uh, Unfortunately, that's what they present to us. And you know, despite us having made a lot of uh, improvements in, in therapies, the reality is this is still a, a very progressive disease, high morbidity mortality, high hospitalization rate, with a survival you could see one year about 83% and three years in the 50s. So again, a, a very, very deadly disease. The, one of the biggest challenges in pulmonary arterial hypertension is just recognizing it. And you know, this is something that you really have to have a high index of suspicion. You know, it's like, it's like that Elvis Presley song, you know, you kind of have a suspicious mind. Uh, maybe I'm dating myself. Um, <laughs> but so, uh, I mean, this is something that you really have to have, you know, ask yourself, could, that, could this be it? And it should be considered for anybody that you see that has shortness of breath or fatigue, and I know this encompasses probably about almost 100% of the patients, but you cannot otherwise readily explain, and, and, and of course, echocardiogram would be the one you, you would use to screen, uh, but if you have also combination of exertional dyspnea or some kind of angina and any syncope or presyncope, um, I think the, the, the risk or likelihood of pulmonary hypertension being the culprit kind of climbs up. Now, going back to our patient, this is uh, our, um, our, her EKG, again, really unremarkable. And not only are the symptoms nonspecific, the routine screening really don't help you. And you can see there's really nothing that, that will show for it. Now, this is what you can see and in some of the folks with really advanced pulmonary hypertension. You could see the right ventricular strain. You can see the right axis deviation and the, and the uh, evidence of, of uh, RV um, hypertrophy and strain and so forth. But just because you don't see this, that does not mean that it, it is not uh, a possibility. Same thing with x-ray. I mean, you know, uh, you, you're not going to see a fusion. You're not going to see consolidation. You're not really going to see anything um, overwhelming. But you know, what you can see is the fact that you see, you see some in, um, increase in pulmonary arteries. It doesn't really project well. And you could see a um, uh, diminishment of the retrosternal space because, again, that RV is uh, sitting there and taking up the space. Now, of course, echo is what we turn to uh, for um, our oops, for our uh, screening test. And you can see in her echocardiogram, you can see markedly enlarged right ventricle and right atrium and just a florid uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And on the uh, short axis view, um, do we have access to that? Okay, maybe. 
Okay, this is supposed to be a moving Keep part. Working. Yeah, okay, no, it, it's not, okay. It did move and it did show that it was a, a very much, um, uh, uh, there's a D-shaped D septum here because of the high pressure in that in the right, right ventricle. So the RVSP of greater than equals 35 should raise concern, especially when it's accompanied by evidence of um, right heart pressure overload with right, right atrial enlargement, right ventricular uh, um, hypertrophy, dysfunction, and any significant tricuspid regurgitation. And the ACC expert panel does recommend that you go further in, in evaluation of your patient if you have a uh, RV VSP of 40 that um, otherwise cannot be explained. So this is comes to our first question, which is um, absolutely right heart cath is needed prior to starting treatment in, in pulmonary arterial hypertension. Echo is a great screening test. It is not diagnostic, and you could do harm to your patient by misdiagnosis and starting them treatment on a regimen that actually can exacerbate their symptoms, actually make them worse. Not to mention the cost of these drugs, which I, if any of you uh, try to get um, uh, any of these drugs approved, I mean, we're talking about a significant um, financial burden as well. So there are many reasons why uh, you must go through the steps to get them uh, what the right diagnosis is. Now, um, so the, the answer to the question was right heart catheterization, not right heart catheterization with vaso, uh, vasodilator challenge. So this kind of encompasses when, whom, why, and how uh, you do the, the vasodilator challenge. So this is for identification of patients stable enough that you can actually push that um, high dose calcium channel blockers. If you remember the back in 1980s, early 1990s, when we did not have any treatment for pulmonary hypertension, this is what we used to use. I remember when you know we used to use a, a uh, three, four, five hundred milligrams of nifedipine, you know, because there was nothing else. Of course, people, majority of people didn't do well, but again, uh, these people, at that time, this was 100% fatal disease. So, uh, and this is the key bullet point, which is, this is only recommended for patients with idiopathic PAH, hereditary PAH, or drug-induced PAH, because in all of the other forms of pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary artery hypertension, the results are misleading and the response, response rate is very, very low. The agents we use in the cath lab are uh, inhaled nitric oxide, about 10 to 20 parts per million, um, IV EPO, and uh, adenosine can be used. Use of oxygen, uh, PD, PD5 inhibitors, or calcium channel blockers are strongly discouraged. And when you do the test, uh, and, and you ha somebody has high pressure and they're a responder, they respond pretty quickly within the first 10 to 15 seconds. So it's not something that you have to watch for, you know, five, six minutes. If they're a responder, they're going to be very, very, uh, it's going to be um, uh, obvious on your monitoring screen. So this is the definition of a, what a positive acute response is defined as, and you must fit, meet all the criteria. You must have a reduction of a mean PAP of greater than 10 to an absolute of less than 40 and without any change in cardiac output. Now, the reports say about 10% of uh, idiopathic PAH can meet this criteria. Um, and some reports uh, are much less, about to 5 to 6%. And, and, and uh, uh, jumping to treatment, uh, if, if somebody meets the criteria, they're stable, in other words, they don't have any evidence of heart failure, their blood pressure is stable, renal, renal function is stable, and, and, and they have a really robust response where calcium channel blocker uh, trial is warranted. They need to be followed closely, done with a very slow and a cautious manner, um, and if they do not improve uh, to a functional class one and two with a dramatic, almost normalization of the hemodynamics upon repeat of the right heart cath, you really need to add other uh, pH-approved therapies. So with that, um, this is a second. Yes. Uh, so regarding this patient's uh, remote history of DVT, which is the best uh, test to rule out chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? Is it A, a pulmonary angiogram, B, CT angiogram, uh, VQ scan 3, or D, uh, no need to rule out? Again, more than one person. Okay. Now we're 
That's great. So if I can just touch upon this as, as the screen unfolds, um, the right answer is the VQ scan. And um, uh, there is uh, sometimes a thought that if somebody has pulmonary artery hypertension, and we know what the ideology is, such as in this lady, it is associated with a scleroderma, there's, there's really no um, reason to seek out or work out for other potential ideologies when that is really not true. Um, somebody can have scleroderma, obviously, and have, have a, a chronic thrombo thrombolic uh, uh, problem. So uh, everybody really uh, needs to be screened for pulmonary hypertension, I mean for CTEF, I'm sorry. And I, I see that 64% of the, of the audience got this right, so this is great. Um, so potentially curable with, uh, with a, a corrective measure surgically, um, and, and there's definitely now a, a medically um, uh, uh, approved therapy for this. Um, about three to four percent of QP patients really do not entirely resolve their clots, and one half of those with CTEF really do not even have a history of, of, of a PE event. So we are still not clear as to how this evolves over time in certain individuals. Um, normal VQ scan is a binary. It's either, you know, you have a normal uh, a test or intermediate or high suspicion, which of course warrants further evaluation. Um, CT angiogram then definitely can detect it, but its um, sensitivity is much less in the VQ scan, as you can see there. And as far and and um, all, also the specificity is is very specific, but the accuracy is not uh, quite as robust as a VQ scan. So you can see the abnormal uh, VQ scan again. You know that's that's a very um, obvious, strikingly abnormal picture. And with with a patient undergone surgery and having uh, taken out the uh, the clots, you can see layer um, outlined there. So this is a, a one of the forms where it, it is uh, almost curative, and and in many patients actually it's curative. So this is something that we are very very vigilant about uh, looking, uh, making sure that the workup includes the VQ scan. So this algorithmic uh, table you can see really lists all of our uh, all of the uh, current diagnostic modalities that we use besides the echocardiogram, VQ scan, um, uh, we are very diligent about asking our patients, you know, how, you, how do you sleep? Do you snore? Do you hear your husband snore, wife snore? Um, and, make, and even if they do not report it, if there's high enough suspicion with body habitus and so forth uh, to, over, to order the overnight exometry. Uh, we order the underlying causes for, um, uh, uh, with the labs and functional testing with six minute walk. In some patients, you can even use a CPAT with a treadmill testing to see how they do. And of course, the right heart catheterization as we covered. Now, um, do you want to cover the, uh, her sure. results? Okay. So um, after, the, after everything's come back, we did more further testing. PFT showed mild restriction, uh, DLC of 42%. BQ scan was, showed low probability for um, chronic thromboembolic disease. HIV was negative. Sleep study was negative. Uh, Six-minute walk was significant, only 325 meters, and she did DSAT to 84% on room air. Right heart cath uh, showed a normal right atrial pressure of five. Artery pressure was uh, significantly elevated, 72 over seven. PA pressure also significantly elevated, moderate to severe with 72 over 22 with a mean of 38 millimeters of mercury, and her wedge was uh, six. Output was uh, um, output and index by thick with 3.4 and 1.8, which is significant um, effect on her cardiac, on her, um, cardiac capacity. Her peripheral vascular resistance also very high, 9.4, and normal is three. Um, venous sat, or less than three. Venous sat is, uh, was 51%. So she has moderate to severe, um, significant pulmonary hypertension. Um, summary, 65-year-old female with confirmed pulmonary arterial hypertension with normal right atrial pressure, but again, decreased cardiac output, normal renal function, normal systemic pressures, functional class three, and desetting upon ambulation. So at this, at this point, um, so what is your best uh, treatment regimen for this patient? Monotherapy with endothelial receptor antagonist, um, embrocentin, bocentin, mastentin. Monotherapy with PD-5 PD inhibitor, either sildenafil, tadalafil. Upfront combination therapy uh, using both of these agents, all of the above or none of the above. Somebody is really paying attention. There's one person that just is right on it. <laughs> right on it. OK. All right. Okay. Okay. So I, th I think uh, uh, 
uh, majority of the, of the audience will be using upfront combination therapy, um, and there's some folks that will use uh, monotherapy starting with PD5 inhibitors, and uh, some people that said all of the above. And so, uh, I mean, when I made this question, uh, it was supposed to be all of the above because really, uh, if, if you read the current guidelines, uh, you can use monotherapy or upfront combination in somebody with their profile. So, we'll, we'll go over a little bit. So, the mechanism of the way the drugs have been uh, developed over the years is either to block the, um, the endothelium pathway, as you can see here, which is a very powerful uh, mitogen and also powerful vasoconstrictor, uh, or either augment the nitric oxide pathway um, using uh, direct stimulation with SUG uh, stimulator or uh, uh, decrease in the degradation through the PD-5 inhibitor, and the prostanoid pathway, which is a very powerful uh, naturally produced substance that enhances uh, vasodilatation. Now, we, as I mentioned, we have 14 uh, therapies approved for pulmonary arterial hypertension. You can see the majority are orals. And in the process, process, prostanoid family, we have IV, sub-Q, and in also inhaled as well. But majority are, are um, um, orally, oral agents. What is new to the whole armamentarium, of course, is the selexid pack and also the um, oral triprostanol, which are the new prostanoids that are now uh, can be given without intravenous line and so forth. So just a very brief uh, description and, and uh, about the uh, uh, each class. Um, ERAs are used commonly. It is a very powerful uh, uh, drug, actually, um, in the pulmonary arterial hypertension armamentarium. Um, it is effective in the connective tissue disease patients like ours. It does have evidence of antifibrotic, anti-inflammatory effects. Um, it does not work immediately, but uh, it does take effect just like some of the, with the beta blockers use. And there have been reports of long-term benefit with monotherapy in people who respond, and they really uh, respond and they stay well for over a long period of time. There's a, a strong suspicion that very, uh, there's a genetic component to this. Um, it is not effective in somebody that has over right heart failure in front of you. Somebody's a demitis, short of breath, and they're in, you know, uh, in, in uh, obvious need of IV diuretics, this is not the time to start uh, ERAs. The side effects I've listed there, fluid retention is most notable, um, especially with the elderly. The ambrosentin out of all three of them tends to have this um, most aggravating uh, side effect. Liver toxicity with bosentin, so you need monthly liver function testing, and anemia with mesotentin. PD-5 inhibitors used a lot. Um, it had enhances, of course, NO uh, cyclic GMP pathway. It is fairly, fairly well tolerated, and, uh, and, and there's a potential for development of tolerance. One thing I did want to cover is the risk of developing of NAON, the non autoerotic anterior ischemic, ischemic optic neuropathy. Um, this is a vascular event due to decrease in blood flow, and it's a, the most common cause of a sudden vision loss in the elderly. So the risk factors are I've listed there. If somebody has a small cut to ratio, uh, disc ratio, diabetic, hypertensive, hyperlipidemic. Uh, if they have history of atherosclerosis or they just had an eye surgery, probably not, not somebody that you want to put on any PD-5 inhibitors. Uh, so this is something that uh, as we use this drug more in the elderly, as they get more defined or, or, or found with pulmonary hypertension, this is something that uh, we, are, we pay attention to. And of course, you cannot use with nitrates. Uh, um, Real Seaguat, this is the SDG stimulator, very powerful agent because it can actually enhance the pathway in the absence of, of low um, uh, internal system. So it can directly enhance or it can stimulate. And it is definitely more potent than the PD-5 inhibitors. Now, because of that, hypotension is the most common side effect, but with careful uh, titration, I, actually most people do very well with it. Now, because of um, uh, this and the sildenafil, tadalafil are sort of in the same family, there was a, a sort of a direct uh, test that was done, 50 patients, it's really non-controlled, um, to see whether you know, they would have a better profile after, after the uh, switch. And indeed, uh, if just using the six minute walk test, People that were switched to a, a real sequel did do better, but again, this is a very um, uh, uh, non-controlled study. And currently, it is approved for pulmonary arterial hypertension group one and group four for CTAF. Uh, Prostanoid, this is a drug that we've used for, since the 1990s. It is the most effective, um, and it's something that we use for rescue therapy, for bridge to uh, uh, liver transfer, for port 
Portopulmonary hypertension patients, in patients that we intend to undergo uh, thromboendorectomy, uh, we also use as a bridge for that. Um, there are serious a number of uh, side effects I've listed there, um, and of course the the risk of having a um, Hickman catheter is is you know, something that our patients live with with infection, um, thrombosis, and you know some the line just coming out. I mean, all kinds of things can happen, and they do happen. This is why um, usually. Even though it's most effective, we saved it for last because, again, although we as clinicians would really recommend it, the patients read about it and they really don't want to go to this route unless they know they have to. So although it's the most effective, you know, we were not able to use it up front. But that's until now, and actually now that we have two oral uh, prostanoids, uh, the oral triprostanol, which is only approved for monotherapy because it wasn't effective or shown to be effective as a combination treatment, uh, uh, therapy, but also Selexipec, oops, sorry about that. Selexipec is um, the um, IP uh, receptor agonist, and this uh, has been approved now about two years ago. And a largest study in pulmonary hypertension to date, over 1,000 patients, and you can see that a long-term uh, result, you can see that uh, a treatment with Selexipec was markedly uh, beneficial uh, in, in uh, a sort of a composite endpoint. So not just a six-minute walk, but a composite endpoint. And it, it was over uh, a functional group 2, 3, 4. It was on background therapy or monotherapy. It was um, across um, all spectrum etiologies as well. So a very... Um, uh, uh, excellent regimen to have for our uh, patients with pulmonary hypertension. And then one more, ambition. So the, um, uh, one of the questions was, would you, would you use upfront combination therapy? And this is sort of a, uh, an idea that was talked about for a long time. You know, in, in just like the way we treat cancer, when you have cancer, you know, you treat patients in a heart in initially, and then you detract your, your therapies, right? In pH, for some reason, it, it grew that, you know, we kind of start with one. If they don't work, you add another. Um, so, you know, finally, we had a test, uh, 500 patients uh, randomized where uh, uh, about two, one, one, so about half the patients received uh, upfront combination and the other uh, one drug each. And as you can see that there's a clear delineation of benefit over long term in the upfront combination really did better. Now this is not as easy as to do in clinical uh, practice because all of these drugs have such a uh, myriad of side effects. But having said that, um, what we do now is either start upfront or do a very rapid sequential uh, treatment for our patients. And in the interest of time, um, I'll wrap up. In order to know which, how to treat your patients, you really got to know what risk they are. For our patients, for instance, you can see that um, uh, she did not have any sign of right heart failure. Um, she, uh, she did not have any syncope, but her walk uh, test fit here. She was functional class three, and her hemodynamics and her BMP all kind of fit here with maybe one trace here, and her her uh, her cardiac output was kind of low, so she had a little bit of diminished uh, 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 cardiac output that gave her one high risk feature. But mostly um, our intermediate group. So with that, um, if you look at the latest guidelines, what they what they recommend is uh, initial monotherapy or. Um, um, uh, uh, initial combination therapy, and if there's an inadequate response, you double that and you, you add on to her, her uh, to the regimen. So I'm just going to wrap up with our patient. So we did start on sildenafil. We talked about prostanoids, but there was a concern for GI side effects. She had a lot of uh, uh, this, this motility that she was concerned about. She did improve a little bit, um, but you know not remarkably. And we did acetamacetentin, which tolerated well. And she sort of started to improve, do more, get out more, and was able to have more quality of life. Um, then we uh, initiated triple therapy with Selexipec. Um, again, very slow titration due to rectal prolapse and all of our other GI symptoms. But now, actually, after being on the triple therapy, her uh, functional class has definitely improved. Her walk test has improved. And I think the number says it all. I think um, from her original right cath, if you look at her follow-up right heart catheterization with a mean PA pressure falling from um, 72 to 22 to almost normalization of 32 over 16, and with her improvement in cardiac output, you can see now she has a very healthy, robust cardiac output. So I think uh, the, for her, uh, the triple combination is working for her, and, which, and, and um, she's actually improving steadily. So just some, some take home thoughts. Again, I'd just like to uh, ask you, keep this diagnosis in the back of your mind as you run through your patients. Know that this is readily treatable, but you need to get that echo, and you need to get that patient to a center that, that can be uh, undergoing, undergoing the evaluation and treatment. Thank you so much.